this this has this phenomenon has emerged you know on ETH a long time ago right and we can talk about ETH here right like this is not a we, oh yeah this is on the table yeah <laughs> yeah well, well frankly speaking we're going to deal with a lot of problems that you know other ecosystems well, mostly ETH have dealt with so I think you know it's very very important for us to look at okay what happened there and what kind of solution worked what kind of solution you know is not quite working so one thing I think people who are paying attention to this clearly feel right it is is that there are a lot more predatory activities happening on that pool now there's a lot more sniping there's more rbf is i think that generally just creates like very negative externalities leaking and spilling over to regular users who are just doing their thing but back to your point right what really triggered this is that now we have different tiers of transaction preferences for transactions, different time preferences for transactions. Some are much more urgent because the time value of those transactions, they lose us over time. And if I don't capture this, it's gone, right? So I'm willing to pay much more. And as a result, the entire, the entire network had to suffer. Welcome back to Bitcoin Season 2. I'm Charlie Spears, host of Bitcoin Season 2, which is produced by Blockspace Media. Bitcoin Season 2 showcases new ideas from new voices on Bitcoin. It's the technical and the cultural smashed together. New discussion on the oldest blockchain. Um, Bitcoin Season 2 is produced by Blockspace Media. Make sure to check out our other uh, content. The Guart Show, I highly recommend. The Mining Pod, we have a newsletter that comes out on Mondays and Fridays. Uh, make sure to hit our website and see all things block space content. So today I'm talking with Leo Zhang, uh, founder of Alchemia. Leo's written some of the foundational pieces on the commoditization of block space, and I'm glad to have him on the show. Welcome, Leo. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So um, we got to hang out a while in Hong Kong last uh, month uh for bitcoin asia it was a lot of fun we got to go down some rabbit holes um but you've been building towards launch uh this company uh alchemia can you just t explain to me talk to you the structure of alchemia um what is it what's the vision how does it work certainly yeah so um i would describe alchemia as the market of all on-chain markets um, so as as you know, block space is where everything has ultimately has to settle on, right? And it doesn't matter if it's a simple transfer or nowadays these kind of uh, mempool sniping activities that you're getting more sophisticated, crazy RBFs. Um, it doesn't matter how complex or simple these transactions are. All, ultimately, all of them have to settle on chain. And all these surging demands that compete for a finite amount of resources, which is um, which is the block space. And block space, you know, in essence, is is the amount of like full node resources you're purchasing to run your uh, transactions to uh, purchase, you know, settlement finality. Um, and that that requires that requires payments, right? That requires costs, and this is something that affects every user who's using Bitcoin. And uh, it you you know you wake up and you want to uh, just do a very simple regular transfer, but you know some some crazy runes collections happening. You know OKX is doing UTX so consolidation, and there's a bug, and it has nothing to do with you, right? And you get hit with this impact. Your transaction all of a sudden becomes five times more expensive to to be uh, completed compared to just you know a couple hours ago so this is a very unpleasant experience for um for regular users for service providers who's conducting commerce is on chain um so a thesis that we have is that uh yeah, with block space, it's it's kind of like the energy, right? It, it is the most fundamental commodity, fund, most fundamental resource that powers the heartbeat of all public blockchains. Um, and given the dynamic of supply and demand, the supply doesn't really scale, right? Like once every roughly ten minutes, it doesn't it doesn't scale that quickly based on the demand. But demand is very ephemeral; it can increase very very uh, 
quickly in a short amount of time. So that pricing of the access to this resource becomes a painful thing to every regular user who gets uh, this negative external externalities leaked on them, spilled over to them. Um, so this has a lot of uh, patterns, I guess, commonalities with how energy's market, you know, commodities market has developed over centuries. And in the past, this hasn't really become big enough of a problem because um, regular users, you know, crypto uh, and Bitcoin uh, hasn't become mature enough to sustain this, to justify this kind of secondary uh, behavior, right? Uh, people are just using, you know, Bitcoin for fun, uh, for 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 uh, very. It's it's a you can say degens. Not... There are a lot of degens on Bitcoin right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we want to create a market where they can they can capitalize on this impact, right? They can they can trade transaction fees um, so that for regular for commerce, for regular users, they can offset some of their costs incurred on chain with the volatility of transaction fees to a high. Uh, for miners, they can use this to capture some of the premium when transaction fee is uh, being sold after. So that's the essence of it's a very long winded way of uh, introducing alchemy, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you say you say um, it, you you describe like Bitcoin's block space and Bitcoin's fee market kind of woke up this past year. So it's like very well timed. I know you've been building towards uh, alchemy for a while, and you're reaching mainnet. It's currently in test. It's currently in test net. Um, but uh, you know, you you float like this early client type of almost like the the ordinals or runes trader as this near present like uh market participant who right now they need this type of product um what is what is like long term the commoditization of of bitcoin block space look like who are these clients who are the market participants like over the next maybe five to ten years think long down the road yeah, absolutely. I think um, if if more commercial activities are, were to happen on chain, right, there would be more service providers, there would be more businesses that are uh, built upon that emerge on, on chain. And so for them, this become a very substantial cost of conducting business. Uh, they don't want this volatility. It's just similarly to, you know, Con Edison, you know, they don't pass the fluctuating electricity price all to their end users, right? So you're locking a contract uh, to turn on your AC, turn on your light bulb. It doesn't fluctuate with the rest of the globe's usage. And these companies, they're, these utility companies are able to do that by, you know, hedging on, uh, uh, energy futures, you know, beginning of the month and lock in the um, price for the average price for the next month or three months. So uh, in five to 10 years, we expect this kind of behaviors to happen in crypto as well, where um, service providers, whether they're, you know, exchanges or uh, sequencers for the rollups or uh, wallets providers, or, you know, platforms that offer collections, right? So these if they want to offer a very pleasant fee experience to their end users, and not to mention if in the future we actually bring like social games, these kind of high, highly, uh, highly active kind of interactions on chain, these are costly. You don't want to pass that experience. You don't want to pass that volatility entirely to the end users. So the only way to do that is through uh, this type of hedging instruments. So that I expect is to, you know, I don't expect average users before they send you know, a wallet transfer to hedge their transaction fee. I don't think that it's quite the case. Similarly to, you know, today, uh, average users, I, I don't, I don't hedge my electricity price, right? Yeah, you don't, you don't uh, set up a synthetic, you know, electricity price contract every time you turn your light bulb on, you just expect it to be roughly X cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so like right now, the, the, current dynamic of bitcoin's fee market is very interesting it's very it's really fun to look at because it feels like it's waking up it operates in these like pulse events or like event-based fee spikes could you talk through this i've talked a bit about this i know you guys through your social media have described like almost like post-mortems on like here's what the here's what happened in bitcoin's fee market right now could you kind of just describe the current landscape of like these pulse-based events, maybe how Alchemia fits into this model or can respond to these, how, how a user might like uh, leverage that. 
Yeah, I think waking up is the right word to use here because these things they have always been happening. Right? They've been happening since you know Satoshi Nakamoto. It's just the kind of spiky behaviors they're less less pronounced. I mean, they were very pronounced for a period of time in the past. The congestions. This, this is not a new thing. Right? It's it's. Uh, um, we have experienced like outage, sorry, uh, uh, congestions multiple times in history, but there was just no good way to deal with it other than okay, I guess we have to scale the we have to scale the infrastructure, we have to scale the uh, the entire network now. Uh, and these these things they take efforts, right? And, and I think um, I think scaling is something that will always happen and it always should happen, but scaling efforts they require a long cycle of investment, long cycle of uh, energy and efforts. Um, so it doesn't quite necessarily solve the short-term fluctuations. And in fact, I don't think it will ever will. Short-term fluctuations is inherently a market-oriented uh, issue. So, um, so I think the reason people start to think, oh, uh, we have a, you know more dynamic fee market now, one with having um, now that fee is a uh, much greater percentage of miners' revenue. Miners are much more sensitive to this. So miners are starting to think more about, okay, how do we capture fees more compared to in the past where they're just, you know, sitting around because you know, it's not really that big of a deal for them. Right? So um, now it's critical. It's critical. It's continuing to become more critical. So that's why we see um, some of these out-of-band solutions, right? We see like more creative solutions of trying to capture that. Um, I definitely think that Ordinos is... It was the the it, it changed things it changed it changed the bitcoin culture for you know better or worth uh and but it definitely changed how people how, it definitely changed the composition of the mempool it definitely changes the weight of transactions that people are are, are doing and you can I, definitely mempool is much more full compared to the past yeah. um yeah well so, it, it, it's like it's uh one of the way i put is that um Previously, you had just one type of transaction which users were using, you know, creating, which is just like a normal financial transaction that wants to be included, you know, have block inclusion in a certain window. But now we have like a wide range of transactions with different um, urgencies to them. Or, you know, a person doesn't ma doesn't mind if their JPEG gets on Bitcoin today; they just want it to be on Bitcoin over the next month. So they're they have an entirely different like time profile. So it's really interesting to look at this. Yeah, and um, this this has this phenomenon has emerged, uh, you know, on ETH a long time ago, right? And we can talk about ETH here, right? Like this is not a we, oh yeah, this is Bitcoin <laughs> it's on the table, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, frankly speaking, we're going to deal with a lot of problems that you know other ecosystem, well, mostly ETH, have dealt with. So I think you know it's very very important for us to look at okay, what happened there? What kind of solution worked? What kind of solution you know? it's not quite working <laughs> so um one thing i think people who are paying attention to this uh clearly feel right is is that there are a lot more predatory activities happening on that pool now there's a lot more sniping there's more rbf is um i think that generally just creates like very negative externalities leaking and spilling over to regular users who are just doing their thing but back to your point right what really triggered this is that now we have different uh, tiers of 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 uh, transaction preferences for transactions, different time preferences for transactions. Some are much more urgent because the time value of those transactions they loses over time. Um, and if I don't capture this, it's gone. Right. So I'm willing to pay much more, and as a result, the entire um, the entire network had to suffer. Yeah, and so um, you, uh, I'm not like really f myself familiar with conventional uh commodities markets outside of oil and i don't and i've not really studied derivatives um but you know i i you know ask you some about how you're like how you think about alchemia like are you trying to model this after other like successful like commodities uh, structures like how do you do you look at what has worked in history and you just say what does this look like in the modern Block, blockchain era like how what are what are similarities between existing commodities markets and alchemia yeah i i wouldn't say we're taking you know some you know orange trees playbook exactly here uh because i i think it's it's quite different um especially for uh this is inherently digitalized this is inherently 
um, there, there's there's a production schedule, right, of of, uh, of block space uh, compared to you know uh, I don't know orange trees, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good yeah, so, it's a great example. Yeah, so it has some uh, codified, uh, not quite schedule, but patterns to it, uh, and these are things that changes how currently this market work, how the supply and demand uh, mechanics work, and these are things that we can't really escape from. So when we think about okay, how we're going to design this this uh, market because this is really kind of a secondary market on top of the activities that's happening, you know, on chain like simultaneously. So when we think about that, we have to tailor a solution for Bitcoin. We have to tailor something that's like inherently, you know, not too like we can't just like put oh okay, this is what worked for oil. This is definitely going to work for Bitcoin. Um, um, in fact, we we have tried multiple different solutions in the past and arrive at the current uh, current version. Which, yeah, we're still experimenting. <laughs> yeah, and so what uh, it was it was interesting because I I've only kind of recently started thinking about these concepts. You have different types of like the financialization and commoditization block space. You have like physically delivered block space, which would be the block inclusion, the transaction inclusion into blocks. And then you can create synthetics from that. Um, and I haven't really fully thought through this question here, but what are your thoughts on like the differences between physical delivery and synthetic exposure? Like what, is, what does this mean for users? What does this look like in the market? Yeah, I think they're very different products, in fact. Um, so even though it's so uh, this is actually a great example of how it differs from traditional commodity markets, right? So even uh, physically different oil versus paper oil there, you're still trading on the, the price movement of thing. Um, and of course, there's wide range of uh, logistics issues that's that's introduced that make them very, very different makes one superior to the other. Um, I think with Bitcoin, the so-called physical physical delivery block space is entirely different product that catered to entirely different type of users comparing to uh, uh you know paper block space uh so first of all what who would want to use physical physical delivery block space what, what does it really mean is that i want my transaction to be included in the first 20 of a specific block height for some reason right so for some for some reason oh, and, the next bitmap uh, that, that was my favorite example the, the anyway so yeah yeah so the the but the reason is that there, there's some like very the exogenous factors um that that have led me to to want to purchase this um so this is more evident on on <laughs> on ethereum again um with pbs right so builders for mev searchers they would want to sequence their transaction in, in a specific order uh so that they can maximize the value capture um but that is entirely exogenous to like it, it, it is it is a behavior that's introduced like externally so the reason i wanted it is because i want to capture that external uh, uh opportunity right so uh for that it, it's a very very specific thing um and it has very little to do with like oh i want to uh earn fee rate right like i think that market activity is going to increase that, that has very little to do with that it has very little to do with like hedging out my uh transaction fee risk it's more about i want to capture that opportunity my transaction needs to be the first 20 of the block uh 846 327 or something like that right yeah um whereas for if you're just trading this you know, if you're trading fee rate that's entirely different consideration so if i'm you know uh, uh wallets uh and i'm trying to compete with my competitors by offering a uh fixed you know withdrawal cost uh, well, i think river or if i remember correctly recently announced something like that like zero fee withdrawal yeah, yeah, per they, month yeah they yeah, something like that or something but yeah yeah no, yeah yeah but if if you know let's say i'm a service provider i want to offer this kind of like superior experience to my users but i inevitably have to bear some risk um, so in order for me to feel feel good about bearing this risk or like have some certainty on how much risk I'm bearing, I want to use these type of like financial instruments to hedge out my risk. Um, so that's entirely a very different consideration because it sort of abstract out the whole 
uh, you know, se the sequence of, of transactions in the block or block height, you know, these things don't quite matter for the context of trading uh, synthetics because all I want is if fee rate is going up, I'm taking a gain, right? That That's, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You you brought up the example of wallets and wallets may be competing on fee rate because they're customers of the end users. And I, um, I guess I was comparatively recently introduced to the idea of the transaction supply chain, which I guess is a familiar concept in ETH. And in a way, wallets, particularly retail facing wallets, are the like are a core part of the transaction supply chain. And a lot of wallet people that I talk to are like, what it, you know, maybe come to terms with the reality that what even is the wallet business? How do you make money off of it? Maybe your business model is that you're actually a transaction supplier. Um, I know this may be the MetaMask model or some other. Um, but I'm glad you brought up um, block space markets on ETH and Solana. Um, and I'm also glad you brought up PBS, Proposer, proposer Builder uh, Separation. Do, like, I don't know if if I feel that we have found a resolution whether that was good or not. Um, I, what are your thoughts on this? And does Bitcoin experience something similar to PBS? Or how do we mitigate some of the negative externalities from that? It's a very open question on that topic for you. Yeah, I don't think the ETH community, uh, specifically the researchers, have really arrived at a conclusion regarding PBS. Um, with with PBS, a very clear direction uh, that is trending towards, and, and frankly, people have you know warned about for you know years, is that the builders are highly concentrated and and, and they're starting to verticalize, right? They're building uh, their own relays. So and, and there, there's just like a lot of efficiency you can achieve with centralization, with verticalization, with owning like different part of the stack. Um, I, I think if we were, if we we're, if we we're, uh, you want to be super precise with the technicalities, um, PB, like, there is like kind of proposer and builder separation. The mining pool is the builder. That's, I, I, yeah, I say this, so like, I feel like I'm like, yeah. <laughs> currently has PBS in a way. <laughs> yeah. P P P PBS was, was, was introduced like on bitcoin first yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah and and we see this effect right there's a lot tons of centralized there's there's also centralization on mining pool level so pbs had already happened on bitcoin and the builders have the equivalent of builder has already been uh uh you know centralized and of course the exact dynamics doesn't quite and how the transaction flows uh from the search to builder to proposers doesn't quite work the same as um on bitcoin but 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 uh the analogy is not what we're trying to uh talk about here right uh but it's more on what is the long-term solution for bitcoin to combat uh mev and how to prevent that from leaking to average users unfortunately i think um in absence of fast iteration <laughs> uh i i think this we we're going to have to rely a lot on centralized service providers to try to provide provide a better experience on behalf of the users. There's really, I think, short term, that's the only way for them to do it, right? Um, so, you know, like Magic Eden, well, uh, I don't remember if, if if it's still the case, but I, I remember a while ago due to, uh, and people, their, their ordinal state, their transactions couldn't go through because they get sniped left and right. So yeah. they offer some refund. Uh, it is a, am I remember this correctly? Or? Oh, oh, I, yeah, I don't know about the terms of refund, but yeah, there's, there's been people throwing stuff at the wall as far as mitigation or compensation. Yeah, it does. It, it yeah. tends to like sniping <laughs> tends to plague the, the ecosystem when um or the users whenever things are going up because snipers buy snipe low sell high so yeah yeah and there's really not no good way to mitigate that right like and and frankly you know looking at some of the solution that like like ocean protocol like come on like <laughs> how is this how is this real like it's 2024 uh, and, and <laughs> so <laughs> so um it, it it doesn't sound great, but I think short term, medium term, it is really up to centralized service providers to like how much of a better experience they want to offer their end users in order to stay competitive. Right? So if two equivalent services 
One is offering some kind of compensation if their you know users transaction get uh, sniped. Uh, the others, the, the other one doesn't. All right, it's like all right, okay, I'm I'm going with yeah. this one. <laughs> so. Yeah, and this actually gets into um, a piece you wrote a while ago. I forget when, but um, the piece uh, "Things Hidden Since the Foundation of Block Space," and uh, you had a line in there which is something like "MEV will keep growing in the future." I wrote it down. In the future, expect the majority of block space will be filled with MEV activities. Block space is a new kind of market, a market of constant action, of waves and fades, of tricks and ruses. We're now starting to see this more at scale on Bitcoin. It's more of the power user driven MEV and not as much the block producer MEV. Um, what are your thoughts on, because you wrote this years before ordinals and years before mempool sniping was maybe commonplace what are your thoughts on this now does mev keep growing again it's a broad category but does toxic mev increase um yeah what are your thoughts on this yeah i i think this is a i, I think mev is is inherent property of how pu public blockchain works I, I i think as long as there's main pool there will always be mev um, and I, you know, people love to complain about this from a philosophical level, uh, but frankly, I think this is, this is, this is not strictly worse comparing to, you know, how Robinhood sells the transaction flow to a Citadel and they, you know, and you have nothing to do with it, right? Like, uh, unless you're trying um, to trade, unless you're trying to trade GameStop, it's a wonderful user experience. <laughs> it, it does provide a, a, a much better, you know, user experience. But that's a, uh, I think that's a slight different thing. Uh, I mean, it, it is the same thing though. Like it does, it does impact user experience. So it does impact, you know, Bitcoin user experience. So like, if you're just trying to do your thing, and then fee rate just goes through the roof, and it's like, what? Like, okay, I, I'm just gonna send someone. I'm just gonna send demo instead. Right? <laughs> you know. Um, so, I, th I think it's not something that can be just easily uh overlooked because like oh you know this this is some degen shit like it's gonna go away it's gonna go out of fashion and and i'm on my high horse just looking at my you know maxi tech right it's not it's not going to play out that way and i think it's it's very obvious um i think it's very obvious given you know the kind of shit that we're seeing on yeah. mempool. <laughs> <laughs> the mempool so. the mempool uh, the, one of the catchphrases that i've seen is like the mempool is a bigger marketplace than magic eden and it's kind of true if you just think about the throughput of all of the fee activity and settlement through that um that is the ultimate final boss for uh just commoditization of this space um i i it kind of brings me to another question which is um you know, even though it feels like Bitcoin's fee market woke up this past year or so, if you still look at just the the aggregate revenues of fees to Bitcoin, it's still like not a lot for a, a blockchain, which is the oldest 15 years out where like the whole point is that this is supposed to, I would hope soon, transition to a fee driven uh, revenue towards miners. Like at some point, we you would hope that these actually gain a robust dynamic market to them. But, um, you know, I, I look at Ethereum still consistently, like just, uh, just dramatic, you know, dramatically generates way more fee revenue than Bitcoin. Um, is fee revenue the only way to um, value block space or are there other components to this? Um, cause I feel intuitively that Bitcoin's block space is, is more valuable yet. It does not generate as many fees as ETH. Do you agree with this? What are your thoughts on this? Like, why does Bitcoin's, why is Bitcoin's fee market still feel relatively immature? Mm. I, I think so for, for this question, uh, I can give a, uh, a marketing oriented, give me uh, both answer answers and I can give, yeah, a more thoughtful answer. I, I think so. Uh, I, I think 
the the to the moon answer is that yeah like bitcoin has a lot of potential energy right dormant capital it's been there for years and just waiting for the right people to unlock and it's there just look at the second best oh right like look yeah. at that garbage is able to produce so much activities we can do it too right and l2s are coming bitcoin season two is coming it's going to unlock so much activities bitcoin block space is going to generate so much revenue it's just it's going to happen but i think the more the real the real answer here is that it's very difficult to compare uh apples to apples right it, it's not quite a direct comparison because if if we if we looking at it from a pure financial lens uh it is how much i'm spending to produce um, a block uh, from from a miner's perspective, and how much fee, how much revenue I'm capturing that block in order to 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 pay for my to pay for my expense. So I think there's there's the reason this calculus is so so uh, it, because it involves so many moving pieces because my cost is entirely incurred in the real world. I have to pay physical infrastructure, I have to pay for electricity, power, uh, labor to maintain the machines, I have to pay you know. Uh, 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 bit main, or right? I have to pay shipping, I have to pay customers. There's just a lot of like physical dollar denominated cost that's very difficult to evaluate and, and evaluated over a long, longer period of time. Whereas for here, right, it's okay, the probability I'm able to capture the next block, or if, you know, FPPS is slightly different, but uh, the spirit of it is the, is the same. Um, and how much, you know, fee has been, uh, in, has been, you know, packaged into this block. What is the dollar cost of the, this 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 fee? Like how long? What is my holding period of, of these bitcoins? Um, and now, looking at the comp composition of the revenue, we start to think: okay, how much of the fee comes from you know ordinary those activities? Come, how much of that comes from you know ruins and all these things? Are they uh, sustainable? Are they going to become lower, higher? Um, so, I I think comparing to something like uh, ETH, where the fee market, fee market has been developed for a much longer period of time, is really just the sheer amount of like activities and that introduces volatilities and introduces competition for the block space, um, which I think we're just beginning to see on Bitcoin. So that's, you know, a very fair thing because fee rate is entirely generated by sort of the kinetic energy, right? Not the potential energy. Like, Bitcoin can have a massive market cap. It can be the absolute unchallenged, uh, you know, digital gold, and, and everyone should love it. But it's very different from the connected energy, which is okay. I need to move it. I need to uh, use it to do all these things, right? So that like scenario is we're just beginning to see or or waking up to to it. Um, I I think for miners the this is starting to become less of a you know a couple of years ago a philosophical question of oh security budget is it enough to sustain now it is a real question um miners should have vested interests to invest in things that produce more activities so back to your um your your amazing tweet that summarizes really well like miners are investors of ordinals they just don't know it yet in yeah. fact i think miners survival are you know reliant on things that can keep producing activities they want things to move they want people to to move this thing uh that's yeah <laughs> yeah i'll uh i i we we pulled really far back i want to tie it back in and wrap this up with uh back to alchemia and the your current ah. intestinate phase um you've been demoing some of this tooling it's pretty cool uh i like to i'm looking forward to delivery on mainnet um talk me through the current state of alchemia and uh and and maybe what the path towards mainnet launch looks like yeah so uh for for those who are not familiar uh you can you can you know, check it out on uh, alchemia.io. The um, the bazaar is 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 live on, on testnet right now. Um, so you can long or you can take a long position or a short position on average transaction fee, uh, average fee rate. So if you think that okay, there's going to be another wave of uh, ruins activities that's going to push up the fees. If you and, and if you are confident that oh, this is going to be huge, 
then a very you know obvious way for you to capture that profit is through you know long fee rate um or that helps you know offset some of your your cost of of uh, of being a degen um and you know if you think that it's overhyped and the, and, and the fee decay is going to happen faster than people think you can take the op opposite side if you're a minor you can take the opposite side to to lock in your your uh your fee revenue um so this is all these interactions are all you know possible now um and you know the ui ux is far from perfect we're making a lot of you know rapid <laughs> improvements to it uh and and hopefully uh, next time people look at it, it's it's going to be much much better, and I'm confident it will be. Um, so we are launching in July on Magnet, um, and uh, uh, I think around the time of Bitcoin Nashville, uh, this will become more well known. I think so too. You know, I right now Bitcoin's Bitcoin fees are down, but we know if we you've been here the past year, you know that. You could feel it almost brewing, just like another uh, another frenzied activity sometime. I don't know if it's runes driven or ordinals driven or some other degenerate speculative idea. But um, I look forward to uh, getting totally liquidated on Alchemy. I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, I look forward to leveraging the product. I think it's really, really cool. It's about damn time we had uh, options and ways to do this in the 15th year of Bitcoin, uh, we should have ways to hedge fees. So, um, yeah, anyway, uh, any final thoughts, Leo? Yeah, I, I think the ultimately it comes down to, okay, more people are doing stuff with Bitcoin. Right? And I, I think that's undisputed fact. And that's a good thing. That's what we wanted. So more people are doing things on Bitcoin. They're moving, that inevitably leads to Bitcoin getting moved around. That creates more kinetic energy that creates volatility to the fee market that affects everyone. Um, so I think this is something that we want to create an experience where people are protected in some ways or people are able to take advantage of it uh, in some ways um, before this becomes you know, out of control. The fee rate itself on Bitcoin becomes out of control. <laughs> yeah. All right, you heard it. Thank you so much, Leo. Um, I look forward to having you back on Bitcoin season two once the fee market gets really heated and we can do maybe some live triage on what it actually looks like and what it's doing. So hope, maybe I, I would love to have that happen sooner rather than later because it makes for more interesting content. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having me.